Well, hello, and welcome to Opal City Confidential, a Starman podcast, episode 58. And today we're going to be covering three comics instead of two. The normal Starman part, which is Starman Volume 2, Number 29, The Return of Bobo, and we'll get into that first. But we're also going to cover Ted's Adventure and All-Star Comics 12, and we're going to look at its retelling in All-Star Squadron Number 30 by Roy Thomas, Mike Macklin, and Robert Howell. But let's start with the main thing, Starman Volume 2, Number 30. Let me give you some pertinent data from couple sources no here here we go such as mike's amazing world of comics let me get you the publication date from that because it is not in the fandom wiki so this was published on february 20 february 12 1997 has a cover date of april 1997 uh editor the amazing one of the greats archie goodwin uh, title is The Return of Bobo. It's a 22-page story. It features Jack Knight. It is written by James Robinson. Pencils by the amazing Tony Harris. Fantastic inks by Wayne P. Von Grawbadger. Letter is Bill Oakley. Colorist Gregory Wright. It has been reprinted four times. Um, Starman Infernal Devices Tradeback, year 2000. Starman Omnibus Volume 2 Hardcover, 2009. Starman Omnibus Volume 2 Trade Paperback. And the Starman Compendium, Volume 1, 2021, which is what I used. Um, what it doesn't have is some uh, some of the trivia and some of the other stuff, including synopsis. But let's do creators first. Executive Editor Jeanette Kahn and Tony Harris says an amazing, amazing cover. It's got uh, Solomon Grundy, Starman Shade, Matt O'Dare, Ted Grant, and Michael Starman. Uh, Michael Thomas Starman, and it looks like a movie poster. It says, Join the Revolution. It's awesome. I'd love to have a poster of it. I would absolutely love it. And it's been up on the socials, and it'll be up on the socials again. Um, some of the characters appear in this. The Shade, Richard Swift, Starman, Michael Thomas, Ted Knight, the O'Dare family, Clarence, Hope, Mason, and Matthew O'Dare, the Royal Flush Gang, Ace of Spades, Android, Jack of Spades, no... Ooh, no secret identity on that one. Okay, King of Spades, John Carney, Queen of Spades, Monica Taylor, uh, Ten of Clubs, Wanda Whalen. I didn't really know they're back. You know, they're just villains that jump up in certain things. Justice League, International Justice League, other things. Uh, the Mist is in this, or um, in a flashback mostly. Um, and that's what we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, Charity uh, is appears in it, uh, the Stand in for Madame Xanadu is the way I like to think of her. And then Bobo Benetti, uh, Opal City Locations, Club Cobana, The Fortunes and Forbidden Tale Shop, Knight's Observatory. Um, in the beginning of the story, Jax receives a letter from Nash. She writes, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the rest of that, He does, but we'll get to that. Read you quickly the synopsis from the, uh, the DC fandom wiki. When Bobo Benetti is released from jail, he heads back to his hometown, Opal City. He's immediately put under surveillance by the O'Dare family and the Starman clan. They believe he might rob a local bank. He does, or rather his attempts to. But as he's about to announce his holdup, the Royal Flush Gang bust in and yell that they are holding up the place. Jack Knight crashes in for the rescue, but he doesn't know who's the real bad guys. He and the now P. Benetti team up and play a little rough and rummy with the gang. When the dust settles, the gang is hauled off to jail and Benetti is hired on as the bank security officer. Yeah, this is such a fun comic. So let's start with the cover again. It is a great cover. It looks like a big, it looks kind of like a Soviet recruitment poster or so. It really, it, it's just great. It's got this great framing, this gold framing with the DC logo on one side and Jack's star, the, the the astrological star pattern from the back of his jacket. And that's what Michael's standing in front of in the main cover. And he's glowing. And then Jack's got his staff over his shoulder and they're these red and black star flags. They're very cool. Solomon Grundy's in front. Matt O'Dare's got two pistols, the shades next to Jack. And um, Ted's just reading an astro science, astro science magazine science fiction magazine with himself on the cover in his originals costume. It's great. It's great. Uh, maybe I'll make this uh, my avatar on Twitter. Uh, but it starts with Bobo. Bobo's having a drink. Bobo's been in prison for a long time. And he's stopped by the cabana. Just as, you know, he's like, Club Cabana ain't what it used to be. 
for sure it ain't. And the bartender tells me, what a nice lunch crowd. So it's that kind of restaurant, and he's talking. Uh, he tells the bartender, used to be a super villain, and he kind of goes, yeah, I'm out. I haven't decided what I'm going to do. He asked Bobo, did you have a nickname? The cops gave me one. I hated it, and it was Bobo. Um, so, but he has a drink, and he leaves. I love, um, he's like a 1950s gangster, man. He is all these amazing things. I love Bobo. He's kind of like a Robert Mitchum character. He reminds me of an Astro City character called Steel Jack. If you've never read Astro City, do. Um, we've talked about it already. Graham came on and we talked about it, and I would love to cover more. I think it's one of the great comics of all time, especially when it's uh, uh, in a deconstruction of superhero. But, but, uh, but Bobo reminds me of Steel Jack, a convict who comes out and does good. Um, and the title page, which is like four pa- three pages in, says Return of Bobo, and it's shot like a nice camera. It's, almost, it's very film noir. But we jump to the astronomy. Uh, the ast- ast- uh, the, bleh, um, the planetarium where um, Ted does his work and Jack's crying um, and Ted uh, Jack starts it with like has it been wood word he's asking his dad no the Masons have been trailing Bobo for the last hour he's about to switch f- with another officer so Bobo doesn't get wise that's Ted talking to Jack uh, and he notices Jack's been crying and Jack hands him a letter and says, I got a letter. The miss told me she was coming back here 10 months after our last fight. Then today I got this letter from her telling me why she's delayed her return. And Ted asks if she's been hurt. No, she's not hurt. Read it. My dearest Jack, my love. Is that how she refers to me? Yeah, well, it's twisted. Tell me about it. And then Ted reads a letter. I'm going to read a big chunk of it for you, folks, because I think it's important. If you, have, I'm, it, it's just such a this is such a great moment, and Jack is reacting to this way where I think I would react. I'm sure by now you've questioned why I haven't returned to Opal and struck again. The fact is, I won't. Not for a while longer, anyway. The reason for this is, I'll tell you. I'll get straight to the point. I've had a baby boy. Our child. Doesn't that make you feel good to know? When I had you at the toy factory, when when you were unconscious, I lay with you. We conceived the child then. With you in my arms, so peaceful and still, that was really quite a day, all in all, wasn't it? I've named the boy Kyle. That was my dear brother's name, as you know. And what you might not know is that it was also my father's real name. The boy's middle name is Theo. I was keen that he have a little of both of our fathers in him. I'll teach our son to hate you, Jack. He will be my brother and my father both. Does that make you feel good knowing that you've sired such venom? I'm enjoying our son at present. We've been traveling through Europe enjoying the sights and sun, but I will return soon. More will die, and I'll, you will be unable to prevent it. Love as always, missed. P.S. Our son's eyes are blue. There were some interjections by Ted during this. But he's just, he's, he's like, he, he starts off by t- telling Jack, woo, I think I'll sit down too. And Ted's reaction, Jack's reaction is, yeah, Grandpa, real kick between the legs, isn't it? I read that again. This is the first time I've read this in years. And that really hit me. It really hit me that that powerful moment. I knew what was coming to happen. I knew that she had used him. She, she, uh, she drugged him and sired her child with him against his will. And the child has had like a little cameo in, the, in one of the latest JSAs. But it's so, so... I can't imagine what that would feel like to the the sense of violation, the the sense of someone your your child that you have never seen and you're you're being turned into a weapon, the possibility of it being turned into a weapon against you and the rest of your family. Man, and Robinson and Harris fucking nail it. It is just an amazing two pages of conversation and character development. That moves the story along. I love it. I love it. It is this comic's really about Bobo, is it? I don't know. It's about all of them, and Jack has a, some more to play in the story. But it just kicked me right where it counts, 
and it hit me and it was emotional kind of reading it. I had to pause reading for a minute because I had forgotten how powerful a scene that was. So let's move on. We cut to the park where Bobo is confronted by uh, Clarence and Hope O'Dare. And Mason is hiding behind a tree and he's just feeding the pigeon. He's, you know, if they just have a conversation. I'm not doing them do, you know. Um, he's said, here's a good point. I, I can't say I'm not sure. At the moment, I'm trying to see if I fit, if I can live in the present. Even though Opal still looks the same, I have an anxiety that everything's changed, but I can't see how. The only thing the same is me and these pigeons. Because, they, you know, he's he hasn't decided if he's going to be a criminal or not, and that's what they're kind of pressing him on. Um, but then you see Jack talking um, with Charity, and they talk about Mason a bit, you know, that she th- she he knows that Mason is the one that she foretold in that his early issues as the person she was going to fall in love, and they have a nice little conversation about it. And Jack wants her to read his cards because of uh, Kyle, and she reads them, and he sa- she says, I see the same, trip to outer space, day of thunder and lightning will come. And you have a son. That's new. Yeah. A boy. One day you'll know him. You'll hold his hand and smile. And you'll go for a car ride together. Hope. She gives him hope. I love it. So Mason's tailing him. And instead of just tailing Bobo catches him and says, Hey, kid. Don't go. Come here. Um, and they take a walk. They go through the tunnels into the French Quarter. We see Matt and Hope going, What is he doing? Um... It's just hysterical. It's just great. We see we cut to Ted and Michael and Jack talking about following Bobo. They see Bobo and Mason on the move. They end up in the this other district. Is this the French? Yeah, I think this is where they're heading to the French district. Um, and they're just having a conversation, and he's asking him stuff. And all the while, um, Michael and Jack are tailing him, and they're talking about the Deco Opal. Um, and he asked Michael, have you been here? And he goes, and he goes, yes, I've been here. And Ted, and Jack goes, do you have, you have with my father? No, before. And they get a flashback of him battling Felix Fowles and Martian Manhunter. Oh God, I want a Michael flashback story by Harris and, um, Robinson, um, Bobo and uh, Mason keep going. They're having a conversation, just discussing the changes and about life and everything. Um, He talks, and we find out why Bobo went to jail. He caught his wife in bed with another man, and he killed them both. And he sat there and he gave himself up. Uh, Bobo has like super strength. He's a super strong. I don't. I don't think I know how he got his powers, Um, but you know. They just, it's a great conversation. It's its a lot of talking, folks. It's not a 90s or it's not an early, it's, it is a 90s comic. It's not a modern comic where there's almost no dialogues in some books where you really don't know what the characters are thinking. Um, but it's a nice section thing. And they see, then we get to the security savings bank, Opal security savings. And Bobo just flicks two fing- his fingers and knocks Mason out. Uh, at that point, the O'Dares see it. They're radioing for help. Uh, Jack flies off to help. Bobo's in the bank, and he's just about to say it's it's a st- it's a hold up. And there's the Royal Royal Flush Gang. Tony Harris was born to draw the Royal Flush Gang. Uh, it's absolutely stunning. Jack comes through the mirror, man. The layouts on these pages, it, like the their decoration from a deck of cards, silo, uh, framing some of the panels, and. Jack flies in. He goes, what the hell? And Bobo goes, you're the new star, man? You, you're, you're Bobo? My name's Jake. Not a million miles away from your name, come to think of it. Who's the bad guy here, asks Jack. Not me, boy. Not today. But I'm plenty mad at these cupcakes for queering my gig. I feel like shuffling their deck. How about you, stars? You play rummy? And then they start to fight. And we're hearing what they're, we're, you know, they're different colored uh, description boxes. And it's kind of what they're both are thinking. And they're just beating the tar out of them. There's some great stuff in this. But it goes for a couple panels and them just beating it up. And then we get to the, the um, to this one page. And then there's a moment in the heat of it. That moment. When me and stars looked at each other and smiled. 
We smiled like two buddies playing catch in the park. And then the cops came bursting in. The police arrived. That's the end of the fight. It's awesome. They become friends, man. It is this great moment. And we're back in the ball. We're back in the cabana. And Bobo's telling the bartender, the cops, arre- the cops arrested me. They arrested everybody except Jack Knight. For the bank? No. The card gang took the rap. Lady Luck had us picking the same bank at the same time. No, the cops grabbed me for slugging the mason. That's the assault. And all the same time, Jack is talking to Charity about it. And you find out that, you know, he gets a gig at the bank. And he, his last thing, the last thing Bobo says in the book is, cheers, friend. And how about playing some Sinatra? I love it. And then there's a panel at the bottom and it says, ever love an end. But then it says, next volume, Pirate's Tale. And in, volume, in volumes to follow, they of Thunder and Lightning. It's got the pirate ghost and it's got the Marvel family. It's great. It is great, 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 great. I love this comic. It was a nice. It was a nice time to build, move Jack's story along with the the news of the birth of Kyle. Um, it, it, it had such an emotional depth. Bobo was such a ra- fully crafted great character from the beginning. There's action. There's you know, dare. It is Harris and Robinson. The whole team has built this world and put these characters where they need to be and I forgot how great some of these I'm so glad I'm not reading ahead that much because when I read this I'd taken up you guys have seen how sporadic the schedule's been because of work and health I got a really bad shoulder and uh, had to change some medications um, to keep me on even keel and so I played catch up on these and I popped this up uh, open in the compendium about a week ago and I read it and I just it just rocked it it just made my day better it um, it was such a good story it was something I needed to reread I needed something like that that's going to spark it's why I'm buying a lot of comfort comics folks um, because that's what's important to me now I need art as medicine uh, art, art, art as relaxation art as mental health help and storm you can't go wrong you can't go wrong it's just absolutely amazing there's just so many themes we're moving the mason story along um, michael's becoming a bigger part of the story it's just it was off the chain um and tony harris's art is just better and better and better i uh, can't wait to get my next justice society of america i'm getting all the ones with the tony harris covers and when i'm done reading them i'm going to buy frames for them and hang them up in my uh, little man cave and i'll buy the hardcover when it comes out um to match the other volume it was announced uh to di- the i saw the announcement this week that 12 will be the last issue of justice society of america uh jeff johns had said someone else would be taking it over after him but it seems like dc is not going in that direction warner brothers making you know is trying to sp- I, I don't know what they're doing they're ending the da- dawn of dc which i have liked for the most part i've liked all of for the most part i've liked all the jsa stuff the green air lantern you is the least of my favorites but i still enjoyed it um I need to reread the last few issues because I just kind of skimmed them. But there's Green Arrow's great, Wonder Woman's great, uh, Birds of Prey is great. So hopefully there's not much. The big absolute events coming. It's going to be by Wade and Janin. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I need to catch up on some of those the events that lead into it. It's a lot. I got to catch up, but I have not read Dark Crisis, Night Terror, Beast Worlds, oh, and some of the Superman. So. I've got to finish Chain Gang, uh, but then I'll move into, I'm going to start moving into the DC events and kind of catch up. All right, so what's next, folks, is Ted's Adventure in All-Star Comics 12. And give me a second as I get to it. Ah, there we go. I found it. Got so many tabs open in my computer. And I got to wrap this up soon because I've got stuff to do. But let's talk about this. Um, it's All-Star Comics 12. It was on sale June 24th, 1942. Cover dated August, September 1942. It was six, 10 cents, 64 pages for the whole comic. Um, Sheldon Mayer is the editor. Uh, the title of the story is The Black Dragon Menace. It is 55 pages. Features the Justice Society of Earth 2. Writers, Gardner Fox, uh, Jack Burnley, Sheldon Meldorf, Cliff Young, Ben Finian, Bernard Klein, Stan Ashmeyer, 
and Bernard Baylor, the artist. It has been reprinted only once in the All-Star Co- Comics Archives Volume 3 from 1997, um, which I read it from. And the lineup is Hawkman, Adam, Dr. Midnight, Dr. Fate, Spectre, Johnny Thunder, Starman, Sandman, Wonder Woman appears currently in all... S- um, wait, nope, this is this is her first time as a secretary. The villains are the members of the Black Dragon Society. We also see Hootie, Thunderbolt, Myra Mason, um, various War Department people. Um, some notes on this one. Wonder Woman's role as Justice JSA secretary is defined in this story. That's right, she appeared previ- in the last few stories. This story takes place in February on February 16th, 1942. It's retold in All-Star Squadron 30, which we will discuss. This story originally was not titled. The title shown here was given on the contents page of All-Star Comics Archive Volume 3, which in the story was reprinted. The synopsis for this is the Justice Society is to order to round up the Black Dragon Society members operating in America. The dragon stolen eight inventions, uh, inventions and kidnapped the scientists responsible for their creation. Each JSA member tracks down a group of Black Dragons and rescues a scientist. Johnny Thunder, however, is captured by the dragons, but a thunderbolt brings the JSA to rescue him in time. Um, I'd like to read the intro title card to this one because I find it I found it pretty cool. And you know, we'll talk about it. The cover's great. It's a big V for victory, and the heroes are inside the V with Wonder Woman at the point, and the cover says, Just Society of America pursues victory for America, democracy, and another book lect adventure featuring Hawkman, the Atom, Dr. Fate, Sandman, Johnny Thunder, the Midnight, Spectre, Starman, Wonder Woman, uh, and there's a little symbol, Let's Go, USA, Keep them Flying. Um, and then the, the title page is all the heroes drawn by their creators running at... Um, toward us and with a roll call at top and then there's these nice um intro cards which let's call them intro cards from now on amid the chaos of the ward sundered world this justice society has taken its place beneath the stars and stripes and organized into the fighting unit known as the justice battalion uh acting on super special on special assignments for the world apart, war department itself, the Black Dragon menaces the Western world. Strange, fanatical assassins and spies, robed in black with white globe of their order inset upon it. They hold Japan in their thrall, even as they hope to hold the Pacific in the future. Against this deadly danger, the Justice Battalion takes the field. And um, the framing sequence is that the Black Dragon's leader, who's this old uh Japanese gentleman and then he's surrounded by some more of his people and they do have these robes uh and the team's all meeting and then they're called into action by, and we see that we see one of the first crimes and the general ordering someone to go get the justice battalion he shows up and they all fly off and Wonder Woman will say she's taking notes and she's wistfully a wistful look enters the lonely eyes of Wonder Woman good luck boys I wish I could go with you all right, and then we have the other one, Starman fl- Battles a Flying Propeller. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, so another scientist has cre- recreated Greek fire, and Sandman gets that back. The Atom hooks up with a, a Japanese scientist who's made a, a he's, you know, he's, he's an American of Japanese descent. He was born here, and he assists the Atoms. He's the only Japanese character we say that isn't, well, isn't a bad guy, but we're going to talk about something else. And then the Starman part is they have stolen a blimp that has all these planes attached to it, and Starman goes fighting it. And this is freaking great. The I want to say something. I you know I've talked about how the art's up and down. It's Golden Age. The art for each of these segments has gotten better and better. And I think it's just practice. You know, they're because they're doing fifty-five pages a month. Some of these guys are writing their character in two or three books. So. Starman's flying, beautiful Jack Burnley art. He knocks out one pilot. He destroys all the planes, but he can't get up to the balloon because the balloon can go too high. So he starts to freeze up. So he flies down and he makes himself a little heating belt and he flies up and he beats up uh, uh, the Japanese uh, black hand, uh, the black menace, uh, and knock him out. And to free the scientists, he got to hold the bottom of the gondola. But he saves the balloon, 
Uh, Doc fights out in the desert, and there's some Indians. He met some American, Native Americans. I'm not going to say Indians. That was horrible, Ross. Um, but they're drawn that way. They're drawn. It's awful. It's awful. We're going to talk about that. But they cut, they saved the day. Um, Dr. Midnight battles some more. Uh, I don't even remember kind of what they did. Just um, Every scientist has a different thing. He uh, He wins. The Spectre is pretty cool. I like the Spectre one. He just, I don't know why he is, he's like uber powerful and not uber powerful because he should be able to do it, but he destroys a submarine, um, just hurls it in, back into the water. Um, oh, no, no, he brings it back. Okay, he, I forgot. He lands it on the building. I'm just kind of thumbing through this. Uh, and Thunderbolt is, Thunderbolt's appeared at the end of one. And, you know, Johnny is having the bad Johnny. He's battling people with swords and knives and he's captured. And he makes a wish for uh, his teammates to show up. And they do. And they rescue him. Um, and it ends with a punchline. Um, it's a pretty good story, folks. I mean, it is a war, it is a 1940s war era comic. So there is some stuff that wouldn't fly today. The Japanese, yes, they were our enemy at the war. And a lot of this stuff is really leaning into uh, jingoism of the time. Racist tropes of the, of the time. Not only the Japanese characters... But the Indian characters are drawn like an old bad Western. They're wearing headdresses and and stereotypical native garb. You know, it's the 20th century. It's the 1940s. That's it's just insulting and rude. So it's it's a little uncomfortable reading it at times. It's still a good story. I want to say that it is a good adventure. I like that at least one of the Japanese characters was not a villain. He is a, was native born in. Uh, in America, he's an American, and he helps the Adam, and that's l l makes it less less insult. I don't know what the perfect word would be. It he's depicted in the words he's depicted as an ally and not the bad guy, and he's helping fight for his country. Artistically, he's drawn in a racist trope, and that kind of takes me out of it. And it's kind of when I remembered that this was retold in uh, All Star Thirty that I'm gonna add, we're gonna talk about that too. Overall, it is a good example of a well written for its time 1940s comic book. Um, it was the war. It, there is a certain thing about this era. Uh, there was prop. We have propaganda today. We have misinfor. We have all this stuff today, but this is a very very good example of what entertainment was like during the war, especially early on. Um, we really leaned into, we, we were angry as a nation. And we were angry at the Japanese. And these stories were meant to stir up our patriotism. And that's what it read like. There was... There is propaganda films from the 1940s that are horrible like this, and there are ones that are beautiful films. But for, for this, this is a trope that I find a little, these, a little unsettling uh, when I read them sometimes. And today, and today when I reread it, a little bit, a little bit. It's just, I just, I keep talking about, I'm going to probably talk about it less and just kind of really focus, but I'm talking about it more this time because of how Roy Thomas and his group retell this story. So let's move on to All-Star Comics 30. All right. All-Star Comics 30 uh, has a great uh, Jerry Ordway cover. It has one of the black um, menace trying to stab Johnny in the heart while his teammates run in to rescue him. Um, very cool. So let me get to the beginning of this thing. So what it is, it starts with Wonder Woman landing, uh, jumping down off of what a level to the other where Liberty Bell is in the All-Star Squadron's headquarters doing some notations and Wonder Woman's there and she's going to do her notes on this last thing and we cut to a panel which is drawn to be much like uh, this famous panel, uh, Joe State and Bob Layton of all the Justice Society together in one of the all-star comics in the later run. I think it's the absolute, I think it's the last all-star, maybe one of the adventures. I don't have know it off the top of my head, but it just retells and it's retold very quickly. Cause I mean, the other is a 55 page one. You get the introduction, you get the origin of, and the art is by, Oh, I let me boo back. So man, I just jumped right in. I just jumped right in. Let's go back a little bit. So it was published on November 22nd, 1983. 
uh, cover dated uh, February 1984. Uh, it was a 32 pager edited by Roy Thomas. Uh, it, the story is called Day of the Black Dragon. It's 22 pages. Uh, writer Roy Thomas, artist Mike Macklin, penciler Richard Hal, inker Sam De La Rosa. David Cody Weiss's letter, colorist Eugene D'Angelo. And what I'm looking like, I think it's probably Mike Macklin layouts and Richard Halp finishes uh, or touch-ups because they're pages that are definitely Mike Macklin. They're definitely pages that are, are Richard Howe. Good Richard Howe. It was really nice. I think it's, I really think it's the De- Sam De La Rosa inks. Uh, and it's All-Star Squadron. So we're going to, they do that as the lineup. It's Liberty Bell and then all the heroes that were in the All-Star, uh, the All-Star comic. Frank FDR appears in this one. He does not appear in the other one. The members of the Black Dragon Society, uh, Thunderbolt and Hootie are guest stars. Electro the Robot has a little, he is their butler. So we're back, where were we? Okay, so you get it. It's in a condensed story. You see them all fly out. You see Hawkman's tail with the giant propeller thing. Uh, that might be because Richard Howe is drawing it or Roy wrote it because Hawkman appears in every All-Star Squadron because he appeared in all, every All-Star sw- comic. Uh, but it's Richard Howell who was drawn Hawkman at the time. Um, so he gets a big chunk of it. And then on an, we get to page... Hold on, I'm wearing the wrong glasses. Where the, All the other heroes are on page 13. We have Dr. Fate, Doc Midnight, Spectre, Starman. So Army gets one panel in the fight and Sandman. Then we jump to the Adam story. And that is where he meets Mori... Fushida, who is the Japanese American who helps him, he even makes takes part in the fight, um, stopping the uranium ball from exploding, and he's an active part in the fight. And then we see Johnny's story told in in two pages instead of five or six or whatever it was, and they rescue him. And it's got a nice and I post posted this on the socials today. Nice fight scene, one panel, and Wonder Woman's in the corner writing. We see it all and end of mission, and then. Um, Wonder Woman and Bell are talking about the anti-American. Let me, this is, Wonder Woman says this, I can't help worrying about the, the mounting tide of anti-Japanese feeling in this country. Much of it aimed not at Tokyo's warlords, even, but at men and women who live here and were born here. And Liberty Bell goes, oh no, it's not that bad, is it? And Wonder Woman she said, and Liberty Bell continues. I mean, there was a lot of anti-German feeling in the last war, but so far none of that's popped up this time. And one woman says the Nisei, and I think I'm pronouncing it right, which it means Native American. Uh, it's a Japanese word for born in America or born outside of Japan. I don't know the real definition, and I'm not going to stop there. Look it up, but it was what they were called. A problem is, and it's probably racist too. So, the Nisei problem is different. Somehow it brings out other passions, hidden ones, awful and ugly ones. And Liberty Bell goes, you're new here, Diana. Maybe you don't fully understand the American people yet. They make a lot of mistakes, sure, but they're basically fair. Fair, Are they, Bell? I hope so. As fervently as I want anything in this world, even peace, I pray you're right. And then we cut to the White House where FDR is signing the order that will steal the Japanese Americans of their homes and property and lock them up in camps out west. It is one of our great, it's, it's, it's one of our great sins as a nation. Um, by the end of the war, some of those men um, who were probably teenagers when the war started but became of induction age, volunteered for service in our army, and they had a unit that fought bravely in Italy and is one of the most decorated units in the war in American history because they had to prove their other than just being an American they had to prove it with their blood and having the whole life be rebuilt because we took the nation not we personally but the nation took everything from them and asked the same of them that they would ask of any other citizen and I'm really glad that Roy Thomas did it conv- I, 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 I poke fun at Roy Thomas and I really am not I find the end of All-Star Squadron because of crisis in him 
I don't like the way he handled it by just kind of retelling origins and retelling stories. I wish he had just continued to tell all Star Squadron stories with the heroes he had available to him because I think he could have done... This is a great comic. This is a great issue of it. This is one of the ones that I actually like, but it's an early one. The later ones I, is where I really, really get bothered by them, and they're not as good as this, and this is a good story, and it turns it into... it. It fixes the other one. I'd ra- I, if I had to read one or the other, I'm going to read this one because it has that coda where it shows you what the war, not forced us, but made FDR think he had to do. FDR did some great things for this nation, and this is probably the worst thing he ever did. And... Um, Warren Berger became one of the great chief justices, was in charge of it which really the man i'm recording this on the the day after the anniversary of brown versus the board of education where schools were desegregated and that was warren Berger, former governor of california and the man who was in charge of these camps ended desegregation by convincing all the justices on the supreme court to say it was unconstitutional segregation was unconstitutional jim crow was unconstitutional um so it's kind of like history's a bitch. You know, we're in a really revision. We're in a time where people want to move back to these times saying they were better. It was better then. For who? We have to, th- and I'm going to jump off my soapbox. I just think there are issues with the story and I'm glad Thomas kind of redid it. Um, just to kind of show a more full picture of what was going on and to give it a voice with Wonder Woman. Of all people, she is the perfect person to ask those questions of someone dressed, someone like Liberty Bell. Perfect. I think it's great. I love it. All right, folks. That it's, uh, so it's been back-to-back Starmans because Starman I posted last week. Uh, this is going to go up today, Saturday the 18th of May. And tomorrow, episode 100, part one, uh, will drop. Uh, tomorrow, where me, Jimbo, and the amazing Kirby talk the errors of Legion. Thank you for following. Thank you for your 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 support. Where I'm bouncing around and not doing as much as I'd like, I really, really do appreciate it. Thanks to Dave and Pete from Earth Two Podcasts. They're always name dropping me and the podcast guys. I love it. Um, I love being on their show. I I I I will beg them to let me voice characters. Uh, all the time. Uh, and the Shade miniseries is coming up next. So there may be a pause while I get that one together, but there are other things coming up. I will be introducing a new feature to Opal City Confidential called Opal City Midi- Media Club. And the first thing we're going to do is me and Kirby are going to talk about John Carpenter's 1980 film with the amazing Jeff Bridges, my favorite American actor. Um, Sci Fi Six Year with him and uh, Debbie Allen. Uh, It is a masterpiece, I think. It is one of Carpenter's best movies, and it is Jeff Bridges' second Oscar nomination. And um, is it his second? Yes, it's before Fisher King, so it is second, not his third. So look forward to that. I'm also still going to cover those horrible Japanese Starman movies. I got to find. I want to find someone. If you are a fan or have seen the Starman Japanese movies and would like to talk about them, DM me, message me tweet blue sky instagram facebook me something or other i would love to have a guess for those because they're pretty bad and i think we'll have a blast talking about them but folks until then remember be safe be smart be kind to one another remember to be kind to one another and read some comics uh specifically read all-star comics no all-star well read all-star comics i'm loving reading them it's just sometimes they're a little it's a little off uh read all-star squadron and read starman all right 